Uh, welcome to CivilNet. We're honored to have as our guest today, Nubar Afayan, scientist, philanthropist, and entrepreneur. Uh, he's visiting us in Armenia, and uh, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Afayan. My great pleasure, Eric. Uh, let's start off with, uh, I know you're here for some very specific projects that you and many of your colleagues have been working on, uh, specifically the, uh, the GIF and the FAST program. Uh, you know, we hear about these things uh, a lot but you hear these acronyms and you don't really know what these projects are. And many of them really do fantastic work. Can you tell us a little bit about what each of these projects do? Sure. So um, FAST uh, is a foundation, it stands for Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology. It was started in 2017 and it was an effort by us to create a more fertile environment for both education and research in science and technology in Armenia importantly to create linkages with the outside world because you, you know science technology is a global enterprise and if you're going to do it well here you really have to have those linkages so that foundation has existed now for for that five years uh, one of its flagship programs is an annual global innovation forum that it puts on which really is quite remarkable we've been able to attract you know top practitioners uh, of which only some are Armenian many many are not who've come here and brought their expertise. We did one on life science, biotechnology four years, three years ago. We did one on AI. And then with the pandemic, it, we, we were off for a couple of years. And this one was really about life-changing technology. So it was a combination of some medical life healthcare things, some IT things. So that's just exposure. Um, on the ground, the programs that we undertake are scholarships, graduate scholarships, particularly to try to in encourage uh, 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 more women to enter into the field of science technology. So we have a very large program there. We've collaborated with the military in some case to provide some basic AI capabilities, educational capabilities over the years. And there's probably 15 or 20 different such programs. Each are initiatives. If they go well, we'll ramp them up. If they don't go well, we'll come in with another wave of these. So it's really, if you think about it, the word ecosystem is used a lot. Ideally, we'd like to become an ecosystem here in science technology. We have elements with IT and a few other bright lights. And we're trying to say, how do you get systematic and sustainable about it? And that's what FAST is all about. Well, obviously, <clears throat> some of these programs like FAST you mentioned are, have been going on for many years. Uh, 2018, that's, you know, rel relatively, it's, 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 a, it's a relatively mature program. But I know for a fact that you guys are actually uh, working on some new projects. So there's, uh, a, co yeah. so there's a couple can... of new projects. Uh, the, the one we haven't spoken at all about, which is really a pilot phase project, is that we've tried after the most recent uh, um, war, if you will, military uh, uh, confrontations, to really think about the damage that's being done and how ready we are to support the families and the, the soldiers that have been impacted, traumatized with these whole experiences. And so we've looked around the world at what are the best practices in dealing with the psychological stress and trauma, and there are some new approaches. But rather than transport those here, you know, in a carbon copy way, we thought, can we create a version of that that hybridizes the world's experience with an Armenian cultural basis? This is in regards to PTSD or is it much more broad? This is more broadly, you know, the, the, the stress of trauma uh, that could come from war, it could come from the pandemic. So in other words, you know, we're, we're living in difficult situations and the question is, what can we offer? So our particular angle in this program, uh, we don't really have a, a name yet, we haven't really announced it, is to try to see if we can create a hybrid between psychological healing and spiritual healing. The spiritual healing would be the Armenian component of that, based on Armenian tradition, based on Armenian writings, sharagans. Can we create something that has the, the voj, the, 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 the tone, the spirit. The, the, the spirit of an Armenian experience, but with methodologies that are combined with best psychological approaches? To do that, you really need to get you know, folks with, with, with religious background together with cutting edge psycho, psycholog psychologists, psychotherapists, and we're in the process of doing that. If we're able to create a program that could then be taught to hundreds of practitioners, uh, m many of them clerics, by the way, to try to go out in the field and render this service, we would like to imagine a day where that becomes part of the arsenal of services provided by our church, but without it being simply limited to the experience of the church. So really try to bring in some of the scientific approaches. <clears throat> um, uh, it sounds very interesting. I have not, uh, I never knew that the church was actually engaged on such projects. It's least. a pilot, we're just starting. We're trying to see if we can find common ground. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, moving on to a much more uh, social political set of questions, uh, not directly related to your, uh, 
you know, fields. Uh, it's the, the issues of the diaspora in Armenia, and we've discussed this before. Uh, it, is, it is fair to say uh, that uh, we're almost in a crisis uh, for many different reasons, and I want to deal with this uh, without uh, looking at who to blame, because I can sit here and I can come up with 17 reasons on different sides if people have made mistakes. I'm not interested in that, but we have too much of that. Uh, at this critical time, at this critical moment, uh, uh, what are the responsibilities of the diaspora to Armenia? And more importantly, and just as importantly, what is the, what is the, di what is the responsibility of Armenia to the diaspora? Well, first, Eric, you know, thanks for the question. Uh, let me start by saying what you said in one of your recent episodes, which is that I blame myself. And so I'm part of the problem, like you did in that episode. It was very touching. Because I think anybody who wants to be a participant needs to be able to look inside of them and say, what could I have done differently? And I've been coming here five to six times a year for 22 years, way too tolerant of corruption, way too tolerant of, of lack of change, lack of honesty, lack of transparency. And I've gone along with it thinking that's what a diasporan does when they're here because I'm on foreign land and I should only be so lucky as to have even a homeland. Because when I grew up, you know, I came from... Lebanon, and when I grew up at probably five years old and on every single year, I went to the Turkish embassy with a white t-shirt with red paint on it to protest the genocide. And when you've been inculcated into that and you have your own family story, later in life, you kind of go, wow, we have a country now. So, you know, I jumped in head first trying to figure out what can I do to help. And we've been, you know, in many ways ineffective, in some ways effective. So to the question of what, what responsibilities do we each bear? I think that in the diaspora, Armenia's existence is vital, vital to the diaspora's easier existence. In other words, some people cynically say that the diaspora was better off when there was no Armenia because they had to worry about their own existence and therefore they were more kind of fanatical about the topic. Exile is kind of the, the mode that that's in. You know, if you look at the you know, Aga Khan Foundation, they have a global nation because there's no one country. And maybe there's some truth to that, but boy, would I hate to return to that as a way to ensure diaspora survival. Instead, I think diaspora needed to adapt to the reality of having Armenia in a way where we couldn't do it, because we couldn't do it on our own, first of all. And despite multiple gatherings of diaspora and, and Armenian leadership, etc., not much came out of that. Now, the, the recent elections, the wars that followed have completely changed the landscape. And I think we're, we're lost at this point. The relationship is hard to fathom. It's if, you know, at best, you could probably get people who study sociological things to say what they observe, because there's no rhyme or reason to what's going on, in my view. I think, though, that the diaspora and Armenia have to be rooted in the future. And this is something I believe in. This is what I, this is what I live by. You know, the reason I work on innovation, the, work, the reason I work on entrepreneurship, is that all startups have their roots in the future. They don't have their roots in the past. And that is a liberating feeling because you basically root yourself in what you want to become. Now, if the diaspora wants to become a global kind of transnational reality where actually it has connections, and now with digital technology, it's so much easier, among itself and with Armenia to celebrate the identity of Armenians and what makes us different, which is a normal thing to aspire to, you know, Francophonie, all these years later, people get together. Why did yeah. they do that? We could do the same thing. If you want to do that, then the future makes it in our interest to want Armenia to be secure, sovereign. And, and, and by the way, in a pure self-interested way, this might seem you know, calculating, and, and it's fine. In my view, the diaspora should be calculating and say, you know what? It's in our self-interest for this to be a successful experiment. Now, how do we engage? Let's come back to that. In Armenia... In my view, landlocked, having the neighbors that we didn't exactly select, facing the challenges we have with a, you know, an economy that took a gigantic hit when we got the Free Republic and since then has been trying to get back, having a global network in 100 countries of people who have some natural affinity to you and actually not being able to use almost any of it seems like a missed opportunity. It's like having oil under the ground. Priceless. Yeah, and it's like having oil under the ground but not being able to extract it. Right. So and, and I, I believe that that's close to the reality. It doesn't mean there hasn't been a will, but there hasn't been a way yet. Right. We haven't found a way. I think we need to keep trying it. We need to keep trying experiments. So both sides should be motivated in a future where this relationship is mutualistic and, 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 and helps each side grow and succeed. 
I think, uh, uh, Eric, that the situation now, in a, in, in a generous version of it, I'd say the, the government and society here at this point must feel so much pressure, so much uh, desperation that this topic doesn't end, end up being at the top of any agenda. Uh, and you could say, well, it's natural, they're fighting for survival. On the other hand, it's a catch-22, because if your very survival could have benefited from these relationships, I'll give you one last example for the audience just to think about. Imagine if the next time Azerbaijan actually took an aggressive stance, in 80 countries the next morning, there were people on the streets and the government circles actually making the same five demands that citizens of those countries amplified, explained, and, 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 and gave evidence for as opposed to what we do now, which is retweet each other's tweets of some report in Al Jazeera that might have said something positive. I mean, that's what chaos looks like. But imagine if it was organized, and it was organized to a goal, which is to bring awareness in the places where we live that this cannot be an, a repeat genocide. Uh, I said recently when I was here, as one little example, I happened to be at the UN Clinton, uh, 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 initiative, global initiative meeting. I met a former prime minister of a country, an important country, which happens to be helping our enemies these days. And I asked the person, who's a former prime minister, so I, can have it, I said, how could this be? How could, how, like morally, what are you doing? And you know, he said to me that there were interests involved, etc. I didn't know what to ask of him. I didn't know what to tell him. As one person, they might say, well, who cares? You're, it's, it's a new... The answer is if all of us could engage in that. So that, that's one way. There may be other ways. Business, of course, everybody wants the aspirants to come here and make investments. It's not at all clear how sustainable, how, how, how smooth that can be. How do we help that happen? So I can go on and on. The point is, there has to be mutual respect, mutual trust. And right now, I think that is at a pretty low level because of the distractions. I want to move on to something that you might not have known about, but uh, this is more of an internal Armenian thing. Uh, one thing that we have uh, at this country, uh, and it's somewhat contradiction to the state in many ways, is uh, there's almost consensus in the society from, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, taxi driver to uh, the richest person in this country that Armenia needs to become and build a garrison state. Uh, everyone understands that uh, the primary responsibility of defending this country is on us. Uh, obviously, that's a collective, that could be a collective us with the diaspora, as we just mentioned. Uh, and this has become consensus over the last few months, I would say. There's really nobody who would disagree with that. And there's a lot of independent action that's going on, some of it coordinated with the state, some not. Uh, what do you think of this idea? To what extent do people in the diaspora understand the sort of the, what's really going on on the ground here on matters like this? Um, I have the, the privilege and honor to be here so often that I feel like I have kind of a second life here and have had for 20 years. So it's hard for me to separate what I learned here firsthand from what I would have otherwise known. But I have lots of friends whose reactions to some of what they read, I can interpret as utter fear and, 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 and a sense of helplessness in the diaspora vis-a-vis -vis Armenia and almost a sense of of we've let the country down, even though they had no idea what they're supposed to do about it. Um, the idea of a garrison state, which was one of the, by the way, four scenarios that the Armenia 2020 project put forward 20 years ago. There were four scenarios that came out of it. If you go look at the, 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 the book that we, the, that we, the little booklet that we published, it's too strong to say book. In it, one of them was a Syria-like development in which there was a a leader and a military kind of strength that was keeping people under 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 presence. And so, you know, we didn't know what was happening in Syria, but Syria was kind of one of the countries we thought Armenia could become like that. If we went down that path, that would be a little more like Syria. Syria's economic development was pretty limited by that, right? Uh, I'd say in Israel, although it certainly has had a massive military-based economy, it's been driven by and large initially and for a long time by external support of that. And in our case, I think it's hard to imagine that there would be an external support. If there was, I would reconsider it because there, there are some models that lead to success. It's a natural reaction to the situation we're in. We really have, have to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. It's a failure of our alliances. I mean, pretty clearly, we all felt not only that our domestic military was in, in, in much better shape, both training and equipment, than what has proven so far to be the case. I hope that's wrong long term, but that's the case. And then secondly, we have not had alliances that worked. 
in either with the, the, the Russian CSTO environment or <clears throat> with sympathetic other countries which we thought would step in if something went wrong, like France, like the US. Uh, there is an effort now to try to create those. It takes years to create those, as we all know. It's really hard in the moment to create long-term trusting mutualistic relationships. So but we have to work on that. So I think in the meantime, we do have to bolster our economy has to be strong in order for us to have a strong military capability to defend ourselves. I do think the key word in this is to defend ourselves. We are not aggressors. We do not want to be a country of aggressors, I believe, as a diasporan. But we have every right to protect what rights that we've been given and, we've, we've, and, and, and that we failed at so far. So if you tell me a garrison state that is there to protect its existence long enough to create the economic power and the alliances needed to become relevant to other countries, I'm for that. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned economic growth because that's economic growth because that's my other uh, question. Uh, one of the most, uh, and I've said this countless times, it's the schizophrenic nature of Armenia today is uh, uh, at the same time where we have uh, geopolitical issues, we have security issues that are more profound than they've ever been in 31 years. Uh, at the same time, we have, it seems like we might have turned some kind of a corner economically for myriad of different reasons, some of which are frankly beyond me or uh, we don't really fully grasp. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was looking at the new August economic statistics that came out. We're looking at so far at 13.9% economic growth. We're looking at uh, uh, growth in almost every category of business from tourism to, uh, to IT to construction. That is 17% uh, and above, some of them in the 30s. Exports are up by 50%. So uh, we have this, this, this schizophrenic situation, and this is obviously economic growth in the long term is what enables you to do, create a functional state and to be able to defend yourself. Uh, where do you think this comes from? Because obviously some people say it is, um, it's the influx of what's going on in the world that was supposed to be negative, but it's actually it turned out to be positive in the short run. But I think it's frankly much broader than that. Uh, there might be even be cultural factors in the sense that one of the positive results of the revolution is we had this, this sort of the dead hand of the oligarchy has been removed and you know our sort of entrepreneurial spirit is kicking in and people are taking care of their families. One, what do you think drives this as someone who knows business really well? And two, uh, what is it going to take to make this sustainable? Because we know, for example, based on studies that, you know, uh, you had commissioned actually from McKinsey, you know, you have, if we have economic growth in the 10% range for 10 years. Our per capita income is Czech Republic by 2030. I remember reading that. So what do you think is driving this one and two, what can make it sustainable? So um, I, you know, I've seen the same statistics and, and you know, one has to be opportunistic in moments like this to kind of feed what's working, recognizing that you may not have caused it. Uh, it's always the case that, you know, at any given moment in time, the economic performance looks like it's a good reflection of people making decisions. But in reality, we all know that that's that sometimes it's based on the past, sometimes it's based on externalities. And I think we have to be realistic. Certainly, the externalities are helping, uh, even while remittances, I suspect, are down in the last year or so, uh, particularly from Russia. Other factors have kicked in. The remittances are coming in the form of humans uh, and the human capital part is bringing with it financial capital of a very different kind. How long that stays is a function of how hospitable we make this environment to them. Um, you know, last night I went to see a very famous Russian ballet uh, a, a group perform in Sundukyan Theater. Uh, I sat, I've seen such groups perform in New York City. I used to make special trips once in a while to go see such operas. And, and I thought to myself, I can't see this in New York, but I sure can see it in Yerevan. And I thought, well, why don't, you know, why, why don't we have tourism here that actually is tailored to people who would want to have that experience and through no fault of the ballet performers or the audience are now prevented from doing that. One little example. So the question is, will we be able to create the conditions for the sustainability of those factors that have been artificially created? So that's point one. You know, are there other factors? Yes, I do sense a, a freer spirit to take risk and, and a less, less of an oligarchic kind of control and pall, if you will, that rides over the economy. Um, you know, having said that, I think stability is something else that was helping the economy in the past and that will fly in the face of the current environment. We have dependence on foreign direct investment. A lot of these IFIs are going to 
hesitate, they are hesitating in many ways uh, in this environment to make long-term bets, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's in the financial sector, they really need to see both positivism and sustainable positivism, to your very appropriate second question. How this becomes sustainable is that it becomes backed by development of human capacity and institution building. And this is the very moment where there seems to be an excess of output and, and then what was expected to take that very money. Of course, there's going to be a competition between protecting us militarily, supporting the military appropriately, uh, and the families that are, that are bearing the burden of, this, of these fights. But at the same time, not assuming that, boy, if we're doing well, we must be good at this. I recall in, you know, since we started in 2020 project in 2003, Eric, there was a period of, I think, six years of GDP growth in this country that was 12, 13% average. And I remember the World Bank, because they interviewed us for this, writing a, a, a book uh, uh, themselves called The Caucasus Tiger. And it was all about Armenia. And I'm not kidding you, I have the book. It was a big, thick uh, compendium. You know what they do? They go find examples and they give it to all the other countries and say, why aren't you being as good as these guys? Well, Armenia was that, right? Because it was five years of kind of growth. Now, I think instead of saying, boy, we must be good, that we're growing like this, we have to say, we've been given this window, what do we do to double down and make this sustainable? For that, you need to pick sectors in which you can be competitive. For that, you need sectors in which there can be employment growth and productivity growth, not one or the other, not handouts. For that, you need to invest in your education system. All things that sound like, yeah, 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 we know that, but you have to do it. And you have to pronounce as a government that those become the important parts of national security. National security is dependent on those things. So if we're going to talk about being insecure, we have to deal with all of these things. And, you know, look, our efforts over many years, now most recently through the Armenia 2041 Foundation and every future Armenian uh, uh, projects that we have, are all aimed at saying, let's, while we prosecute the present and while we usually mourn the past, let's plan for a particular future and make investments toward that future. You can't make investments if you don't know where you're headed. And so I still believe that what we need to do is to create midterm, let's not call them long-term plans. I think Armenians have a, our history has made us uh, averse to long-term planning because we always think we're going to be persecuted. Fine. Midterm plans that have some logic to them that people can agree on, particularly people in the diaspora that can also be helpful. And then let's go execute those. That's what I think will make it sustainable. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do my final question on, uh, actually changed my final question I, uh, based on what you just said. Uh, one of the biggest issues uh, we have in our media, and this has frankly been systematic and it's been the case for 31 years, is uh, state capacity. Uh, it is essentially as, you know, there's three kinds of states in the world. The first world, the first class ones, the fir first world ones that can actually uh, do the basic things or project forward and plan. Then there's the, the other failed states, which don't really matter. And then we fit in the middle when we have a state that can tell you who owns what property and they can give you your passport and you can do the basic things. They can give basic education to children, but they do not have the capacity to plan anything or actually have the, uh, the will to carry it out. Uh, however, the, what we do have in this country is an ever, ever more competent private sector. I think that's a certainty. Uh, in fact, we actually have companies that are world competitive, a uh, few of them, you know, but they're there for small countries, actually quite impressive. Uh, you come from business and I come from politics and you know people in politics always reject anything that involves privatizing anything and privatization is actually a very politicized word. However, I'll make it much more simpler. How do we weaponize the functionality of the private sector in Armenia in a short gap way to deal with the crises that we're facing, whether it's defense, whether it's intelligence, whether it's half a dozen different things? What practices have you seen? Like, you know, you're going to suggest three things. If you meet with the president, you meet with the prime minister, I'll do these three things to get, for example, uh, uh, that create a pipeline between our, the best in our IT sector in creating or for them becoming a defense company, which in, in, in the world context can even be more profitable. How would you approach that? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that it starts with an open-mindedness to that even being possible. And I don't think that exists right now. I think there's a defensiveness towards um, intervention or cooperation because people, there isn't the basic trust yet that would cause, or even the self-confidence to say, you, know, you have to be really self-confident as a government to open up to that kind of a thinking 
And I think that we need. Of course, if you have facing exigent circumstances, you might be understandable again. But I think absent that is really hard. The private sector has to want, has to feel wanted, armed itself to become weaponized with knowledge, with inclusion. You could put the right safeguards around it. I can assure you that most defense contractors in the U.S. know a lot more about military strategy than a normal citizen does. They're still in the private sector because there are places where you create those protections and you don't just say, well, they're private sector, I can't trust them, I'm not going to include them in anything. So I think whether it's in the financial sector, where there are strategic investments that can be made to tilt the balance a bit more, if it's security oriented, uh, or you name it, I think that it starts with a mindset. I think it starts with inviting folks sometimes to change roles so that you actually have private sector folks that hold some type of a official, unofficial role that, that can act as bridges because you have to understand the language, right? The language of, of doing things that earn votes and the language of doing things that create shareholder return are, are pretty different. And, and so how do you create translators? I think that would be an important thing. And then get some wins. Get a couple of places where such cooperation can generate a win. I'll tell you in the U.S., a major... And by the way, this is a problem in the U.S. as well, probably other than the military sector. I happen to be coming from the recent experience where during the pandemic, the U.S. government, jointly with the company that I've founded and chair, Moderna, and others, NIH, created a joint effort called Operation Warp Speed to literally will into existence something completely unprecedented, which was a vaccine for a virus we'd never seen, in a matter of months, in a matter of months. That was a military-type operation, meaning both, both uh, uh, metaphorically and really. Metaphorically in the sense that the, the planning involved, the multiplicity of bets, the forward contracts that were written to guarantee that there, was, there would be demand for what was being created. And then literally because the military was involved in ensuring the supply of everything that was needed. So that collaboration was a gigantic win. I just experienced it. It was why this, these vaccines got produced. Science aside, heroic effort of people aside, that collaboration. You see examples of that. We can move heaven and earth to do that. It really starts with an internal willingness. I think that the private sector in this country know that they have a responsibility to their families to ensure that this place stays sovereign, stays secure. And you'd be surprised in the, in the group of friends that I have here, whether it's in the banking sector, the tech sector, or healthcare sector, all of which we've worked in, tourism sector, uh, the leadership in those areas are all outstanding people. I, I know many, many people here, Eric, as you do, that I could hire as CEOs of any number of companies that I have in Boston. No question, no compromise. They choose to live here. They're not forced to live here. Those people are patriots. And getting them involved in some format to be part of the fight, part of the struggle, I think is the best thing we can do. Thank you for that answer. Actually, the one thing I would say, which is it's a caveat because we're actually a free society, there's, uh, to, to the extent that I, there's actually one or two cases with the private sector, the state that we do know about, uh, which are actually critical. However, there's also a much more, in a much more significant way, there's a, there's a crossover between civil society institutions and business which is rather interesting. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't exist in other places because it doesn't need to, because in Armenia, civil society actually fills in for a dysfunctional state. Exactly. In many cases. Well, thank you for joining us, Mr. Rafa. This was a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful interview and in, uh, going on all the topics that we did. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this afternoon.